is merely a primer as you're starting to learn about ultrasound for procedural guidance. A few things to remember about ultrasound. It is sound and it's a mechanical pressure wave. It's measured in cycles per second or hertz. Audible range of sound is 2 to 20 hertz, but ultrasound is anything above that 20 hertz level. Commonly, you'll run into diagnostic ultrasound in the 12, 12 to 2 megahertz range. As we have increased wavelength or increasing the distance between peak to peak on these oscillations and waves, we have a decreasing frequency. Increasing frequency meaning we decrease that wavelength or decrease the distance from peak to peak. And this becomes a little more important later on as we get into some of the imaging. Ultrasound relies on the pulse echo effect where we send out a pulse wave of sound. It reflects off tissue and returns to the probe. The ultrasound system then uses that sound reflection to create an image for your view. The echo range principle means that the sound wave is sent out, reflects off some tissue and returns to the probe, but the longer it takes to return, the further away it is. That tells the system how to create that depth to give you that two-dimensional image and distance of objects from the probe. Now, different types of tissue will reflect sound at different rates, and there's a little more complex discussion about how that operates, but as you can see here in this image, the sound reflects off one tissue and reflects differently off different tissues, and depending on the interface between them, it reflects sound differently. And this allows you to differentiate between different tissue layers. Attenuation is the weakening of the sound beam, and as sound travels through tissue, it interacts with that tissue and it continually weakens. Some of that is from absorption, some of that is from reflection of that sound back to the probe. But as the sound penetrates deeper and deeper through tissue, it consistently weakens. Now, another method that causes some weakening is that reflection. So as sound travels through, some sound returns to the system and some sound continues through. And this attenuates that sound beam, but is also the basis of how we get our imaging. Ideally, at 90 degrees, most of the sound is reflected back to the probe. However, if you image something at an angle, some of that sound is returned to the probe, some of that sound is transmitted through the tissue, and some of that sound is reflected away from the probe and is lost to either interpretation or further penetration of that tissue. Sometimes sound is not reflected uniformly, and it is what's called scattered. So the sound wave is reflected back to the probe, but also in multiple different directions. And if the sound does not reflect to the probe, that sound is not used to create an image and that information is lost. So let's talk about the different modes and types of diagnostic ultrasound. We're not going to talk about A mode or amplitude mode as that's not really used in our systems and our setting here. There are specific uses for it, but what we're going to cover is starting off with 2D or B mode imaging. We'll talk about motion mode or M mode, color Doppler, power Doppler, and spectral Doppler. And these are what are available for you in most point of care systems. So 2D, or B mode imaging, B is for brightness, meaning that each pixel has a brightness associated with it. And depending on how that sound is reflected to the probe and the tissue interfaces, it determines how bright that dot is and the differentiation between different tissue layers. And B mode, brightness mode, is also two-dimensional imaging. 3D relies on brightness mode, but portrays it over a three-dimensional structure. 4D refers to 3D imaging in real time, adding that fourth dimension of time to it. M mode refers to motion mode, and what commonly happens is when you activate this, there's a motion mode or an M mode spike, and you can see here there's that green line. And what M mode means is it plots everything along that green line on the Y axis, and it plots it over time on the X axis. And this is commonly used in things like cardiology. Next is color or color Doppler. Now remember, Doppler refers to the change of frequency based on motion. So this can be either by color, by power, or by spectral. Color Doppler activates this color box and shows you flow through that box area depending on the change of frequency. Now something to remember about color Doppler is that we have an artery here shown in red, but frequency shifts are displayed as color meaning red is movement towards the probe and blue is movement away from the probe. So it's purely on relation of motion re relative to the probe. By convention, we try to make arteries appear red and blue, but just activating color does not tell you whether the vessel you're looking at is an artery or vein. Power Doppler does not use a color box pattern like that. It's similar, but it displays a different type of frequency analysis. And this is useful for low flow states. Spectral Doppler 
activates the spectral spike where you would place that in the area of interest in the gate, the area between the two horizontal lines. And what's going to happen is the system will look for motion through that gate and it will plot it as a waveform. So it plots all the deflectors or blood cells moving through that gate over time. And this is what we commonly see for arterial and vascular studies. There are different types of transducers that you will interact with. And the transducer is one of the key components of the ultrasound system. It is also the most fragile and expensive portion of the system. Modern transducers have a broadband designation, meaning they can image over a range of frequency. The probe is what drives the piezoelectric effect. An electrical signal comes in, activates the crystals, which then transform the electrical energy into a mechanical energy or a mechanical pressure wave, meaning sound, and transmits that sound. That sound is then transformed by the crystals back into electrical energy for the system to interpret into an image. Modern probes use a synthetic crystal. Commonly, it's a lead zirconium titanium crystal. And the reason this is important is because these crystals are arranged in a specific pattern on the probe to work, and they are heat sensitive, meaning do not autoclave your ultrasound probes. Autoclaving will disrupt the crystalline structure of the probe and render it potentially useless. So once again, coming back to this diagram, you can see that as we go peak to peak to give us our wavelength, the increasing wavelength gives us a decreased frequency, meaning as that sound wave travels through tissue, the decreased frequency means that that sound wave interacts with tissue less often, and, and vice versa for the sound wave that has a decreased wavelength, meaning a higher frequency. So that higher frequency sound wave interacts with tissue more often. And what that means is the higher frequency sound wave interacts with that tissue more often, so it gives you a greater resolution because it's interacting with more tissue, better resolution, but it also attenuates faster so you get less penetration. Lower frequency probes and lower frequency sound waves give you less resolution because that sound wave is interacting with the tissue less, but it attenuates less and allows you to send that sound wave and allows it to penetrate deeper into tissue. So if you need to image very superficial structures with a greater resolution, use a higher frequency. If you need to image deeper structures and need less resolution, that's when you would go to a lower frequency. And remember, as we talked about, the modern probes are broadband, meaning they have a range of frequencies. So you do not have to change probe, you just have to change the frequency setting on that probe, which will be determined based on the probe that you're using. Different probes transmit sound in different ways. Demonstrate here is a linear array, and you'll recognize a linear probe by that flat interface, and it sends sound out in a very uniform pattern. The, the lines of sight or lines of sound are equally spaced, and you get a very high resolution near the probe and far away from the probe because the lines of sound are very close to each other. Compare that to a curved array, which takes the linear array format and bends it into a curve. This allows you a wider field of view, but you can see that the sound waves start to splay out as you travel further from the probe, meaning that very near to the probe, the sound waves are close together, giving you a nice lateral resolution, but further away and deeper into the structure, they're further apart and give you less resolution. The phased array starts from a very narrow point and splays very widely. This gives you the worst resolution out of all three types of probes. However, this also gives you the smallest footprint in order to image through a very narrow space. And that's why this is used as a cardiac probe for echocardiography, because you can get in between the ribs and in between um, lung spaces to try and get to the heart. Let's review a little bit about orientation and some terminology you'll run into with ultrasound. By convention, each probe has a marker on it, and that marker coincides with the indicator on the screen. So the indicator on the probe and the indicator on the screen should match up. So that square on the side of that curved probe should match the green dot on the image. And by convention, when we're doing abdominal or body imaging, the Indicator is oriented to the patient's right side or the patient's head, or somewhere in that 90 degree turn. And that's so that as you look at an image, you can tell which is right, which is left, which is superior, inferior. Sagittal imaging, meaning the indicator is oriented towards the head or the top of the person or the top of the structure of interest. Transverse imaging means it's oriented to the patient's right or to the right side of the organ. Coronal imaging still orients towards the top or the head of the patient. And oblique is somewhere within that 90 degrees between the patient's head and the patient's right side. You can see here we have two images of the abdominal aorta. We have a transverse view and we have a sagittal view.
and the images look different, but we know which side is right and which side is left purely because of convention and the way the indicator is oriented. So here on the transverse image, I can tell that the smaller structure is actually the aorta because of the way the image is oriented. And I can measure the domino aorta here. And you can tell that which side is the right and left because the indicator is towards the patient's right side in a transverse image. In a sagittal image, the indicator is towards the patient's head and the non-indicator side is towards the patient's foot. Some terminology to describe an ultrasound image. We use echo density. And so anechoic images or anechoic structures mean there are no echoes, meaning they are pure black. And this usually designates the presence of fluid. So you can see here, these three vessels are anechoic in their lumen. Isoechoic, meaning the same amount of echoes. You can see these portions of the liver are isoechoic, meaning they have similar or same amount of echoes within them. The next term would refer to hyper and hypoechoic. And this is a relative scale. So you can see this area is hypoechoic to this area, meaning the liver is hypoechoic to the mesenteric fat. Conversely, the fat is hyperechoic or contains more echoes than the liver, which is hypoechoic to it. So this is a relative scale. Some common artifacts that you will run into that help you differentiate and work with procedures are going to be covered here. These, once again, are not all inclusive. There is reverberation artifact and what happens is some sound beams get trapped within a structure and bounce between the near field and far field borders of it and as it bounces back and forth it continues to send information to the probe. Now the probe assumes that sound is only returning once so as that sound wave bounces back and forth in between that structure and sends information to the probe it creates successive images of that structure. And that's what we see here with the needle where we see the echogenic bright needle within the vessel but we see these repeating lines reverberating from that. And that's that ring down or reverberation artifact. And that's because the sound beams are bouncing around in the needle a little bit. So we're having the images of the wall repeated over and over again. This lets you visualize things like metal a little differently. So you can see that this is a foreign body and metallic in nature, such as your needle for procedural guidance. Next is the concept of posterior acoustic enhancement. We talked about as sound is transmitted through tissue, it interacts with that tissue and is weakened. However, when it travels through a fluid-filled structure, there is no tissue for that sound beam to interact with. And because of that, the sound beam is not as attenuated as the system would think. So as the sound beam travels, it weakens in the tissue, but does not necessarily weaken in the fluid. So a much stronger sound beam interacts with tissue behind it. And what this means is that tissue behind fluid-filled structures appear brighter because more sound is returning to the transducer than I expected, so it assumes that it's a much brighter echo and it places a much brighter image. Posterior acoustic enhancement is one of these artifacts that let tell you that the structure you're looking at that's anechoic is fluid filled and not just undergained or inappropriately imaged, but it lets you know that there's fluid there, whether it be a blood vessel, ascites, pleural fluid, or whatever you're targeting in your procedure. You can see here in this image of a gallbladder that we have normal liver tissue traveling through some fluid. We have a posterior acoustic enhancement in that area, and it's hyperechoic to the normal liver, not behind the gallbladder. And we have an area that travels through more fluid, so the beam is even less attenuated with a much greater degree of posterior acoustic enhancement. And you can see that that is hyperechoic to the second area and hyperechoic to the first area. So you can see that there's these three different areas that show you the difference of posterior acoustic enhancement, telling us that that structure is fluid filled. Remember, this is just a primer on ultrasound physics to get you started as you begin to learn about ultrasound for